We are live. We are live. The Hunt for Success podcast on location. Red's Fly Shop in Yakima, Washington. Cody Steinman, Ryan McCracken. We're here today with Joe Roder for the second time. That's right. How you doing? I'm doing good. Yeah. I can't be better. I was fishing all morning. <laughs> and now, now I'm sitting here chatting with you guys uh, the, <laughs> on the deck of the restaurant. <laughs> well, uh, I got a lot of things I want to talk to talk about we don't have to hit all of them we can kind of go wherever it goes but uh the most obvious for the people that are watching it's not overcast right now it's smoke yeah Yeah. these catastrophic fires i mean all over bc all over the west uh you know i don't know i sound like an you know an old young man when i say i don't remember it being like this you know i've been guiding believe it or not this is my 19th season of spending you know, all day, every day outdoors. And before that, I was a forest firefighter, coincidentally, since we're talking about this. So I got out of firefighting and then got into guiding. And I just never remember this smoke haze. Like every August for the last, you know, five years or 10 years has been, you know, perennial smoke haze, day in, day out. And I notice this because it makes the dry fly fishing typically better. It takes the edge off that sun Mm -hmm. and makes the fish a little bit more aggressive. So I'm very cognizant of the conditions but prior to that we just never had that type of smoke so well how about last year though because i remember the first time i saw this much smoke was last year but we were in vancouver and the gorge was on fire Mm -hmm. and so like we woke up and there's ash all over our cars and you couldn't go outside but i know your history as a a firefighter what's going on with these with these fires because it seems like the fires haven't increased but the size of the fires have increased do you think that that is why we're getting these all up and down California, Oregon, Washington, and BC? We're seeing these huge fires. What's causing that? Yeah, it's just historical. I mean, fire, you know, fire suppression. <clears throat> and I don't think anybody's going to be looking to me for all the answers, but we had some decisions to make on prescribed burning and just forest practices in general because you don't see private timber, you know, company land burning up. You know, they clear cut it, it's an active working, you know, harvestable forest. You know, in Washington State, we have the, the Department of Natural Resources, and, you know, they, they have mixed use. You know, they're mixed use forests, meaning they, you know, log selectively, and, and uh, there's kind of a patchwork. But, you know, a lot of the really big fires do burn the national forest, you know, which is kind of a, you know, somewhat of a monoculture of large timber, and, uh, you know, that hasn't been actively harvested. And I'm not, no way am I suggesting, you know, that, we go clear <laughs> that I, the yeah, I don't, I don't need to go, you know, <laughs> propose we clear cut the national forest, but uh that is part of it you know is definitely these bigger fires that are a bit more catastrophic burn across those landscapes that are you know kind of a monoculture of you know uh maybe underlogged or um dense forest canopies so anyway and that's my perception of it my dad was a logger so i <laughs> <laughs> i'm somewhat biased like i said don't be looking to me for all the answers but we are we are having a lot of fires and it's it's it kind of unfortunate in one sense because I, you know, and I'm such a I'm such a big game hunter. Like I'm a conservationist, big game hunter. I'm very aware of what makes things tick. And I recently read a very interesting article about how hard fires are on mule deer because of the introduction of noxious weeds and non-native plants after a, a fire huh. of catastrophic proportion. So now I'm like really anti like serious fire like I get kind of bummed out like I see a serious fire going I can just imagine the you know all the button weed and all this you know junk that grows in to take the place of the native vegetation and the deer herd struggling and and whatnot to survive but um I'm not sure that's where the podcast was intended to go but <laughs> well I mean I, I think you, you can't come out here and not realize that I mean not be invaded by the smoke yeah and, and uh, uh it was pretty not too bad yesterday, but this morning I woke up, it was pretty bad again. And then I noticed on the way in, there was a lot of grass fires. So, Yeah, and uh, we had one right across from the resort a few weeks ago uh, here that I'm, I'm looking at right now. Uh, and to be honest with you, they burn into the rocks, and you can hardly tell it was burnt now yeah. um, because it does expose a lot of the basalt. But it's part of nature's succession. I'm sure my nature will take care of it, you know, and... and uh, I get kind of, like I said, I get a little bit concerned about the future of deer herds and things like that and how these, you know, semi-unnatural fires might affect them. But I'm sure in the end it'll all work out. So uh, what were you doing today? What class were you teaching? 
So yeah, um, I was teaching a class on a very, you know, I, very specific discipline within fly fishing. So, you know, as fly, if you look at fly fishing as a whole, there are different tools that you would use in fly fishing, much like a golfer might, you know, practice his game on chipping or putting or driving or the mid-range game off fairway. Fly fishermen u- utilize a lot of different strategies on any given day to catch fish within a river. And the one, the, the class that I was doing was called, it's European style nymph fishing, which is that where yeah. like uh, the women don't shave their armpits? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and where the men wear kilts when they fish. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so European style nymph fishing actually it was born out of competition, and it, it and if you were to ask a European, they would be like, no, there's it, that's Spanish nymphing or that's Czech nymphing or that's French nymphing, you know, and they they would have their specific disciplines within Euro style fishing, but uh, in the United States, it hasn't really adapted or we haven't really adapted to it but in a nutshell it was born out of competition and there's there are fly fishing competitions and in many senses they're very healthy because uh they they really they get a bunch of anglers together it's like a rodeo that's how rodeo started a bunch of ropers and cowboys got together and they said hey i've got better techniques for tie down roping or whatever it is and, well, let's see if your techniques are better. And then they would do these events and compete, and now we have rodeo. And now we've got better ropers and, and better steer wrestlers and people who are better cutting horses and things. In a way, competitive fly fishing is the same way because you get these, these rendezvous of highly skilled anglers together that are now competing and sharing, you know, sharing notes and talking to one another and sharing all these ideas. And through time what has evolved is is essentially a style of nymph fishing which is fishing flies that are underwater imitating aquatic insects which are what river trout eat most of the time they get most of their chloric input from underwater bugs so people who aren't fly fishermen now you know something trout eat lots of food underwater in a river Um, but this type of fishing is is highly effective and it was really born out of competition but it never it never really made its way to the Pacific Northwest um, in what I would call kind of the, the, the eastern Rockies, um, you know, in Utah, parts of Utah, Colorado, uh, Wyoming, other parts of those Rocky Mountain states. It has evolved, and uh, anglers have, have, have begun to utilize it. But in the Northwest, it really hasn't, you know, become a thing. So I'm trying to teach anglers how to do it because I want people to be able to go out on foot without the use of a guide and have better catching. Um, You know, on this, the river that we're on today, the Yakima River Canyons, Washington's only blue ribbon trout stream. What is it? Can you, not to interrupt you, well, but to interrupt you, uh, what does that mean, blue ribbon stream? Great question. So I'm not sure about the quantitative breakdown, but there's, uh, they rate rivers in numbers of fish per mile. And uh, so, and then that's like a catchable fish. So that like eight inch trout on up per mile. So like we have 1400 catchable trout per mile, which isn't, a, it's not an enormous amount, but when they, they kind of apply their formula and they, I believe they have to be all, it has to be wild. You can't just go plan a river and be like, Hey, now we got a blue ribbon river mm-hmm. for six months <laughs> or whatever, you know, whatever it would be. Uh, so there's, there's a couple of prerequisites. One, it's got to be all wild trout. Um, and there's got to be a particular density of fish. So it's not just like a specific trout per mile because heck you could take the Columbia river or a giant river. Mm-hmm. And I would say the Missouri river is an example. It's a gigantic river, but it also has a lot of fish in the upper Missouri river, but it's more of about the density of fish. And there's a quantitative formula they use to say, okay, if you have this many wild trout and this much density, it's a blue ribbon stream. So it's only Washington's only blue ribbon stream. However, uh, it, it's a challenging one for anglers to wade fish. Our guided guests tend to do really well. Uh, they tend to have a very good time. Uh, but we cover, say, you know, we floated eight miles yesterday, and we were out for like half a day, you know, solid yeah. half a day. So we floated by, <laughs> not to make you guys feel bad. No, but I, we already floated, did the, I already did the math. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we floated about like 10,000 trout. <laughs> uh so we, we only, <laughs> humbling. Was that yes. like 0.1% that yeah. we 
Yeah, we, <laughs> uh, actually, it might be less than that. It was not <laughs> so, but we had a good time. But we, we by, by sheer covering volume of water with a guide, you're able to generate action. But like, let's just say you guys are going to go out on foot this afternoon. You're not going to be able to to cover a lot of water. So, anglers have really struggled. Like, you know, I've been here almost 20 years, and anglers including myself when I started here, really struggled to catch a few fish. And it's not all about catching fish, but a little bit of it is. If there's never any catching, nobody's going to stick with this sport. Mm -hmm. And this sport could change your life. I mean, what a connection to nature that you're going to develop, you know, by being being in the river, paying attention to bugs, trout, birds, you know. And, I mean, we saw a ton of other wildlife yesterday, but the European-style fishing is a skill that if I can teach some anglers to do it, and we can introduce it to this area. We're going to have a lot more people getting out here and having success wade fishing and doing it on foot. In my mind, that means more families, you know, more success, more do-it-yourself anglers, more people that are aware that this river and wild trout are a very special thing. And that way, when things like, uh, like the LWCF that we talked about yesterday, mm -hmm. Land Water Conservation Fund, it's a very important piece of legislation that Thanks, is... Ray. It's anyway. It's, we'll talk about that maybe if you if you want in a few minutes. Sure. But a piece of conservation that's really important right now. If we don't have a lot of fishermen and a lot of people that understand how special these places are, we're not going to be able to preserve these things for our grandchildren. So more fishermen, you know, a little bit more success equals more fishermen. And our business model is pretty simple. If we can help people catch fish and have a good time, we're going to wind up seeing them in the shop. And so you think that. European nymphing style will increase people's success uh, wade fishing here? Yeah, and part of it is because this river is really tough to get in and just hike around in. It's mm -hmm. kind of boulder strewn, and the, the river flows are pretty tough. But So today, for instance, in this class, I you know took out anglers with a very kind of, I would say, beginner to intermediate skill set. And I might be being a little bit generous on the intermediate side. I mean, the guys are just real basic skill set. And, uh, you know, I, I taught them these skills. They had, you know... Larry caught a couple of fish, but I, I, I personally fish alongside him when I do a lot of these classes because I need to, to show him like, hey, here's where you're going to be at. And we're only casting 15 to 20 feet. This is, you don't need to be Superman to do this style of fishing, which is why it's so appealing. You don't have to cast 100 feet. You don't got to do what we were doing yesterday is way on the upper echelon of challenge. You know, what I was asking you guys to do is much more technical this is technical in a different sense. It's very, very short casting, but it's just making the drift work. Like, there's a lot of nuance to it, but I landed six very nice trout today, and I fished for two hours right alongside these students, showing them, hey. From this, the bank? From the bank, you know, using a truck, parking. And the whole intention of this is to show them you can come replicate this. So the long of the short of it is, yeah, took a couple of guys out, showed them exactly what to do, where to park, where to go, what flies to use, no secrets. Now all they got to do is get some, some river reps in and fig, kind of figure out how to make the little nuance of those drifts work. And like I said, you don't got to be Superman. It is very short casting. It's very simple. Uh, but if I can get people doing that, we're going to get them into fly fishing because they're going to have a little bit more success on average. So <clears throat> one of the things I like about fly fishing, and I don't think I've been very good at articulating this, is there's a lot of skill sets or the way you look at fly fishing that – I can relate to uh, a business. Uh, Absolutely. I just feel that way. And uh, yesterday, we, we for the past couple of episodes, we've been talking a lot about coaching. In our industry, in the mortgage industry, uh, you can go hire a coach, right, that will analyze your business, hold you accountable, keep you motivated, uh, kind of do some consulting for you. And it's not a cheap investment, uh, but uh, uh, I have personally and a lot of the people I work alongside – have had tremendous success using coaches. And yesterday uh, was uh, kind of eye-opening to me because I've been fly fishing for uh, 15 years. And my takeaway from yesterday is I had no idea I was such a horrible fly fisherman. <laughs> <laughs> and that's not because I was berating him. <laughs> no, it, 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 the, the coaching, and that's one thing when I take new people fly fishing, you know, we usually go up to uh, Merrill Lake up on Mount St. Helens. It's a great place to uh, learn to fly fish because you're on a lake. Um, there's a hexagenia hatch at night. It's a big bug. Big yellow yeah. bug. And uh, the hatch can last 15 minutes. It could last an hour. 
but lots of bugs, lots of dry fly fishing. And it's just an easy place to learn. But when I am have somebody new in my boat, I uh, I can tell when they're getting annoyed when I'm critiquing them too much, so I just let them go. But yesterday, I loved it. I loved all, uh, When you stopped coaching and you said, okay, I'm just going to let you guys fish, I was like, no, keep going. <laughs> <laughs> right? but, yeah. but There's a difference between coaching and nagging. You know, yes. there's, yeah. it, there's, there's different fundamentals. And, uh, you know, coaching is definitely like you show – Somebody, the end, you know, I've tried every which way for 20 years, you know, and I was a horrible instructor for a long time. And uh, actually, there, there's a book written on education, and it was called, I think it was called Delivering on the Promise. And I took the author of this book out. Where I'm going with this is he has a PhD in education, and we talked a lot about process for learning. And I learned quite a bit about guiding and instruction from this guy. And I wish I could remember his name. I can't. Go look at the book if you want. We can look it up. Anyway, uh, yeah, I think it was called Delivering on the Promise, and uh, it was about the promise to kids to provide the best possible education. But he went and worked in some uh, native villages in Alaska, and I promise I'll keep this short because this week could go down all sorts of rabbit holes. But what they did when they got to this village, they had a completely unbiased school district. You know, they went in with a different approach, and what they did, they started with the very end goal and then taught backwards. So, and I've started to do that a lot more in fly fishing is like, I will demonstrate the end goal of what this is going to look like. And then we're going to take it apart and we're going to work backwards instead of me putting a fly rod in somebody's hand and say, Hey, do this, do that, go like this and not explaining the whole big picture as to why, but always starting with the end result and starting with the goal, because it's amazing how many times like in your, in your company or any company, if you don't have a shared goal or a shared vision, nobody knows what to do nobody knows why the trash needs to be taken out or why the floor needs to be mopped or why something needs to be properly faced and restocked well all those things need to be need to happen so that we can meet that end goal because there's going to be way too many hiccups or death by a million cuts on the way there Mm -hmm. but starting with the end in mind working backwards and explaining you know this is what it's going to look like then this is how you're going to get there and working backwards in the process. But it was kind of a fascinating, and I, you know, I, I certainly couldn't get into all the, you know, the, the details of what he taught, but I was like, man, my ears perked up. I really listened. I was like, you know, I hadn't really thought about, uh, I hadn't really thought about always introducing the goal first and then working backwards. I had definitely done the opposite. And then the other thing I get this and I'll, I'll hack this story up, I'm sure. But, uh, there's a story just about Tiger Woods that I told you. Did I share that with you yesterday? I don't think so. So, anyway, Tiger Woods, probably one of the most coachable athletes on earth, right? Continually working on his mechanical game of a swing as you age and different things. He has to be an incredibly coachable individual to have the success that he's had. And there's lots of other athletes, but I'm just going to use him as an example because he would was on a fly fishing trip. Mm-hmm. He was on a fly fishing trip with an outfitter on the Deschutes River. And uh, the, the story, as it's been echoed, went something like this. Tiger shows up to go spay casting for steelhead. Goes, go out on a guided trip. Guide starts, you know, talking to him. Here, hey, here's what you're going to do. Here's how you're going to do it. And, and Tiger says, no, I'll just watch you fish for a while. Now, I don't know how the guide's real reaction was, but huh. my reaction would have been like, hey, this is a jerk thing he is, Tiger Woods. <laughs> I, I got to have been like, too good for me, huh? And I would have I carried some animosity with me if he wouldn't take my coaching. Well, Tiger just said, hey, go, go fish. I'll go ahead and watch. And so maybe I'm, you know, I'm, like I said, I didn't hear this firsthand. It was about fourth hand. But Tiger Woods watched uh, the guide go ahead and fish the, the piece of water for like an hour. And he got to watch all the audibles and watched an expert, you know, cut apart the water and do all the expert stuff of the cast and make all these decisions based on wind or obstacles or boulders or whatever. And, and uh, watch the whole thing happen for an hour very patiently. And then at the end, you know, guide gets done, comes back, and Tiger says, hey, I'm ready to give it a try. Again, the guide says, hey, here's what you're going to do. Here's what you're going to do. You're going to hold the rod like this. And did a bunch of that fast talk and stuff that pros do and – was just probably about ready to start nagging at him about the first thing he did wrong. And Tiger says, no, hang on, back off for a second. I got this. And as a guide, I'd be like, I'd kind of laugh to myself. Yeah, mm-hmm. sure you do. <laughs> anyway, picks up the rod within three or four strokes, is completely proficient, you know, on that piece of equipment, never having done it before. Because he was willing to invest one peaceful hour in studying the process and not be, you know, cocky enough or arrogant enough to just jump in and try to tackle it head on. 
willing to watch somebody and study their processes and movements very patiently and very quietly and observe. And how often do we sit back and do we patiently and quietly observe people in other businesses or other operations without immediately kind of <laughs> interjecting ourselves into a process? It'd be like me walking into the fly shop right now <clears throat> and uh, making snap decisions about our staff and what they're doing without sitting back and watching the five to 10 minute interaction of how they're working with customers and things like well, that. Well, and yesterday when we were out, uh, because I, I always have to be cognizant of what I'm doing and that I don't do that, right? So we, you and I were talking about uh, CRMs a little bit yesterday. And uh, I was really curious to what CRMs you tested and what you use and how you use them. And I had to c- consciously say, okay, just listen. Mm-hmm. Don't interject with what your experiences <laughs> with CRM are, right? Just listen yeah. to what his are. And, and I took away a lot from just uh, hearing uh, another type of business uh, use that software but uh but yeah it's being able to turn your brain off and watch somebody else and and uh it was nice a couple times yesterday when you stopped and grabbed the rod in my hand and goes this this is what i'm trying to explain to you Mm -hmm. and then to see you do it it's more peaceful than me nagging at you (laughs) terrible (laughs) cast cody (laughs) well what we actually talked about last night when uh when when we got back to the room i said i actually kind of enjoyed it when Joe grab my rod or Joe grab yeah. your rod and started fishing because kind of like the tiger scenario, I got to watch you do it. And then I was like, all right, now, now I'm kind of picking up, you know, the, the little things. Well, then, uh, last night too, from our room, we could watch the, the lawn area out here. Yeah. And there was, uh, I don't know if it was a fly fishing class, like a one-on-one class or something. Did you see that, Ryan? I saw you. I think those were like our two-hour casting lessons, probably. Yeah. And so after being on the river all day with you, it was nice to go watch some other people learn, like, from the very beginning. Yeah. Uh, Here comes the train. Yeah, we got a lucky us. We had to arrange for this. We got a motorcycle gang going by on the highway (laughs) Uh, because it is a scenic highway. And we've got Burlington Northern towing a bunch of stuff on the other side there i think the train adds to this place well yeah i mean it's uh western rivers i mean it's almost synonymous you know the railroads kind of built the west and then pretty much any major river that you uh travel on it's got a railroad so it's a pretty well we, we we had a rainbow unicorn flow through a second ago i didn't want to disturb you guys though but it was pretty majestic going down the river well, are they, yeah, are they, yeah, are they issuing it. tags for those around here yet? <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, it's one of the busier, you know, typically one of the busier float days of the year, but the weather has cooled off. So, uh, but yeah, a lot of stuff to do in this canyon. I mean, for the, I mean, the motorcycle gang, I'm just kind of laughing because like, it is a, it's an incredibly scenic ride, you know, coming up and down this canyon. It's why, it's what really built our resort. You know, it's you a, got the deer, the the big horn sheep. Yeah, you got a little bit of everything here. So you were, uh, you watched a little bit of Claudia Belladine's uh, podcast, the Romanians. Yeah, I got through about half of that, man. I'm grateful to live in this con- this greatest country on God's green earth, and I'm not ashamed to talk about it or admit it. <laughs> and uh, listening to them, and I was in, and I mean, obviously Romania is a long ways away from where I was in Rus- Russia just a few weeks ago. But man, I got to tell you. What fascinating individuals. I'm, I'm not all the way through that listen, but that's genuine. And the days of like our modern media is so artificial, like what we watch on Netflix or YouTube and how removed we are, even, even real television shows, right? Like they're so polished and they're so such publications to be able to listen and actually watch them. Cause I, I watch on YouTube and be able to be there for those real people and listen to them was it's very interesting i can't wait to watch the back end of that what episode number is that just so people listening can uh, quickly like, find that ryan will look it up uh are you familiar with jordan peterson oh yeah i, I love dr jordan peterson all right so he's a big advocate for podcasting right now on youtube and he says one of the reasons he's having success with his lectures and his message is because we're we're of the technology of being able to utilize YouTube and have a long form conversation with somebody, where I mean we could have done a podcast while we took our lunch break yesterday. We had forty five minutes of awesome conversation that uh, it would be compelling for anybody to eavesdrop in on, right? Yeah. And so being able to have a long form conversation, especially with somebody as smart as he is, instead of an interview. And in fact, I saw an interview with him a couple weeks ago. 
and it was super frustrating to watch him be interviewed because you just want to listen to him talk. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't need this guy to be asking him a series of questions. Yeah. So diverting him from the real, you know, content. Yeah. And, uh, and you could just let the conversation go, and it really did with them. You know, they kind of told their story, um, a very emotional story. And uh, we got a lot of positive feedback from that show, and we have uh, some other Romanians that want to come on the podcast and people from other uh, communist countries that have escaped and are in the U.S. that want to come on. Um, and uh, uh, I can't remember her name. but She's coming on sometime soon. Uh, they escaped Romania, but not the same way that the Belladines did. They Belen, uh, Belendine. Belendine. <laughs> <laughs> no, they uh, they literally ran over the border. Wow. And uh, they talk about that a little bit in their podcast on how some people did that. Most of them got shot and killed trying to escape. Uh, but the, there's another couple that want to come on who uh, ran while being shot at across the border of Romania. Well, I'm glad we don't have to deal with that here. <laughs> talk about something lighter. Not yet. So, so, about, let's go back yet. to so, talk about something lighter, Cody. So just to go back on delivering the promise, so it was uh, by Richard De Lorenzo and yep. Wendy Bettino. Yeah, yeah. I, I I can't say that I got through the entire book cover to cover, um, but I immediately ordered the book and uh, I got through you know bits and pieces of it. It was so many years ago. I can't remember if I got it through a cover to cover, but. Uh, yeah, just some of the strategies that he had for for teaching and coaching were were brilliant and I and really basic. You know, I mean, it's not like any of this was incredibly complex. You just had to take a fresh look at what you were doing and examine, you know, the process you were using because mm -hmm. we do get pretty wrapped up with our heads in the sand. And uh, and we talked about this in fly casting. And we were talking about fly casting and fly fishing kind of being parallel to how you sometimes operate your business and the logic of those two things, but that emotional attachment that I was talking about with the cast, the, the emotional attachment happens within our businesses and within our personal lives and everything else we do a dramatic amount because when you're the person throwing the cast, you've got this emotional charge going, okay, that was my idea. I've got to own that idea. I want to see it all the way through, even if it's bad. Yeah. But then you've got somebody else watching it, you know, from a completely unbiased emotional perspective, kind of like a business coach that you were describing and the business coach is watching your your actions or your ideas, your plans, going, yeah, I'm not sure that really supports the end goal of what you whatever your end goal or your your the mission of your business that doesn't support you know the end goal. Well, and you said this a couple times yesterday. All right, let's change our game plan. Mm -hmm. Let's let's change our flies. Let's change to the other side of the river, and uh, in fishing, especially salmon fishing. I see guys do that all the time. We we fish Columbia River quite a bit and buoy ten, and you'll see guys uh, fish the same spot of river, no matter how slow it is, and they don't go explore to <laughs> a different spot of river, or uh, they'll use herring and herring only. And if they haven't gotten a bite in six hours, they will not put a, a, a Brad super bait on. I'm wondering why they were sitting there for six hours. Yeah, <laughs> that'd be my first question. <laughs> But in business, too, uh, you know, there needs to be that pivot point. And it's hard when you're driving to know when that pivot point is. And, uh, and that's one thing my coach has helped me out a lot, too. He's like, all right, let's change our direction here. You know, let's abort this plan that's not working and implement this one. So I, my, my, my hunting partner, you know, we spend a lot of time together. Best friend. He has a saying, and he comes from a, a very, uh, I would say, high-level forest firefighter background. So he was a longtime hotshot, and uh, they operate on a near militant protocol. You know, if you think about, like, they're the Army Rangers of forest firefighting, right? And uh, so they operate on very specific protocol, and they're also, like, every member of the crew is extremely capable of making decisions on the fly. And he has a saying, and it's just so stupid simple. It's just, let's take a minute and make a plan. Instead of a plan a minute. <laughs> and every time I start getting a little haywire, he repeats that mantra to me. Let's take a minute and make a plan instead of making a plan a minute. <laughs> There's so much truth in that when we get wrapped up in what we're doing. The other one that I know you, uh, you, you liked yesterday was do not let perfection become the enemy of good. Yes. Thanks and that's a, that's a military philosophy that was taught to me by... Um, um, an army officer has uh, since passed. Unfortunately, he was a friend of mine and a fishing partner. But uh, 
Yeah, he would say, don't, yeah, don't let perfection become the enemy of good. And he described, yeah, he was describing that verbatim, those words, uh, you know, the presentation for fishing. And I took that with me. I'll take that with me in my grave for a lot of things that I do because we do pursue perfection based on, based on human ego, um, you know, number one. Like that is, you're, you know, Jordan Peterson is much better served to speak on ego in kind of the uh, – the this, this psychological uh, implications of how ego promotes bad choices in our lives. Mm-hmm. I'll speak to it just on like mm-hmm. a fishing and real basic life standpoint. But so many of the things we do, we don't do to support that end goal. If the end goal is to catch a fish, we maybe don't need perfection to catch a fish. If our end goal is to make some money at the end of the quarter, we may not need to be perfect. We might just need to be good. And there's a lot can be sacrificed when you're pursuing, you know, perfection. Uh, you get too kind of get bound up in a lot of that meaningless uh, minutia that takes place in that pursuit instead of just saying, you know what, in this instance, the best I can do is good. If I pursue, if I try to make this perfect, I'm going to wind up making a big mess of things. And we, we can't do everything. You know, we can't be a ma- you know, we can't be a master of all trades, you know. So, uh, and there's a book, and I'm going to cite another book. Sounds like I read a lot. I really don't. Uh, there's another book called by Ryan Holiday called Ego is the Enemy that I would say I would recommend that book to absolutely everyone. That is one of the most life-altering books. I, I didn't know how to ego problem. Everybody's got an ego problem. <laughs> yeah. Everybody. The decisions you if, make. Yeah, yeah. If, that you don't think you have one. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I don't have an ego problem. I'm perfect. That's, this book is really good for other people. <laughs> That's kind of what I was thinking. But it's called Ego is the Enemy, and uh, it's, it's an entertaining read. It's, it's a lot of contemporary uh, world leaders and uh, business owners uh, that mirror the same ego-driven mistakes of all the way back to Genghis Khan and uh, a lot of other figures in history. And there's a lot of really good, rich world history and a lot of contemporary kind of wor- world issues. And uh, he comes at it from a, a business standpoint, uh, the book. So it's a great you know business leadership book. But uh, it's called The Ego is the Enemy. And I would definitely like, if, if that would be my next read. If I, haven't, if I hadn't read that book, that would definitely be my next read. We'll put that on the list for sure. So what's uh what's what's going on with reds i mean i love this place for so many reasons we've been coming here uh i don't know five six years uh we try to get out here with our families uh at least once a year um but i also like it as another business model to 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 kind of not replicate but explore a little bit and see how are these guys getting so successful how are they using their youtube channel and their marketing and education to build their business. And so what, what's, uh, what's going on? Yeah, I mean, I'll give you the short, the short history uh, of what, kind of where we're at over like the, the past several years. And I hope I don't you know, give away too many trade secrets here. Um, but th- this business evolves so fast anyways. Trade secrets of today are old news tomorrow. Um, so you know, we were really successful in the late 2000s, really getting kind of on the forefront of YouTube. We had this Iranian... Uh, and. Uh, I, I just say Iranian. Uh, I don't know why I always thought his name is Umit, and I'd never known anybody named Umit, and so he's Iranian, and I always always thought that was kind of interesting. Like, but Umit's that guy's awesome. Um, he has a company called UBG. Like, uh, he does you know web design and web marketing and that kind of stuff. Uh, Umit's an awesome dude, and I remember Umit telling us, and and at and like 2007, he said, "Video is the future." Embedded web video is the future. If you want the best possible platform, you get into video. And uh, it, it was words that have altered our business forever. And I just remember going, okay, Umit says that's the way to go. The dude's sharp. I mean, he's just such a cool guy. I haven't talked mm-hmm. to him in years, but I just remember in, in the amount of time I got to spend with him, just usually just on the phone, uh, he was really gave very sound advice. Total totally unemotional because at the time I was a blogger. I'm fairly capable with a keyboard and creativity. You know, I can write well. Uh, but at the time I was a blogger and a writer and it might've been something where it would have been easy to just go, no, nah, I don't think that's good advice. But he had a completely unemotional attachment. The whole deal. Now video is the way to go. And video at the time was a lot more work because you can upload text very quickly. You mm-hmm. could actually generate a lot more text a lot faster than you could actually 
painstakingly upload a video on like, you know, a primitive DSL line or a voice internet. I mean, this is like 2007. Things weren't all that quick firing back then. So uh, video files were way too big. They didn't compress. It was a pain in the neck to upload stuff. But we got into it anyways. And uh, to this date, we got about 6 million views on our YouTube channel, about 25,000 subscribers. Since then, there's been a lot of copycat, you know, a lot of copycat stuff. But, you know, you know, there were several things that have set us apart. And that's how we, I mean, we ship things all over the world every day from this, this shop where we're sitting at. In fact, the whole downstairs of this building that we're at is our shipping and receiving department, which is the majority of our revenue. I mean, this, the restaurant suite where we're sitting, the shop is awesome. It was popping today. At the, end of the, at the end of the season, I mean, majority of our revenue gets put in boxes and shipped out because we have, we're genuine, right? We're real. You can't fake that. In this industry, either you know your stuff or you're genuinely knowledgeable and passionate and and respectable, to be honest with you. So our YouTube channel spoke to that genuineness, that realness. It's not polished. It's not, you know, and you guys chime in here, but when you watch a YouTube video from like about a product, okay, because we're going to talk about retail driven stuff, um, or about a, uh, let's just say a discipline, like uh, Ryan, you love mountain bike racing and riding still, right? You know, Cody, you're watching something about some duck decoys or some shotguns, right? And you get on there, and this video is extremely well polished, and it's got great cinematography. Does your defense go, I, I'm hoping I'm not leading the witness, but does your defense go up a little bit? Like, wow, they put a lot of money into putting this video together at a lot of time. They must be really trying to sell me something. Like, yeah, it's a commercial. It's a commercial. So then you take like some, some, you know, some schmuck like me on the riverside. <laughs> hey, here's how you catch, you know, like, well, here's how we're going to catch a trout. You know, mm -hmm. like I'm genuinely right here showing you on amateur video in mediocre resolution, like genuinely like, hey, and here's not only how you're going to catch it, but here's something that would be useful in the process. And that genuineness, you know, has really, we have really excelled because, a lot of the bigger, you know, the bigger businesses than us and a lot of the manufacturers raise a lot of, you know, that your hackles go up a little bit when you see that commercial coming, you know, mm -hmm. instead of just, you know, like I said, some Joe Schmuck on the side of the river, like just all I want to do is teach somebody to catch a trout. If I can teach them to catch a trout, they're much more likely to buy something from us and it's a win-win for everybody involved. But so that real, that realness that we have is not something that can be faked. If People like you and they want to be loyal to your brand and support your brand and they think you're not only a good person but you're knowledgeable and you can provide good service. All of that stuff has has really helped us. The other several things that that I learned, I never had any, you know, uh, I would say formal education in business, but your education is out there if you're willing to go get it. If you want to go read on Google like, hey, how do I win at the search engine optimization game? How do shoppers find my products instead of other people? You can Google it, and they will tell you if you're willing to read it and study it and execute on it. And guess what? It's incredibly fair. The, you know, if you want to spend some money, great. But guys, again, audit your own you know browsing behaviors. Do you click on sponsored links? Mm -hmm. I mean, if you no, I mean generally no. Like I'm not going to say like it. There's no value to it. But, like, if you're searching for, you know, a disc brake system for your mountain bike, right, you go and you, you're like, hey, I want this specific brake or I have this specific question. Well, chances are you're going to have four sponsored links that are only there because they were paid for, not because they match your search criteria extremely well. So you go down, <laughs> you shoot past the ones with all the little sponsored ads, and you find exactly what you're looking for. So I read all this on Google that it's fair and you have to fill out, you have to, you know, use words and explain things, explain the product, review the product, take your own photos, write about the product, write why this product might be good for somebody, write why it might be bad somebody. Introduce, so how many people are, how many websites have you ever been to that you go look for a product like on a website and it says, well, here's a disc brake system for mountain bike, Ryan. And but you may not want this one because you might want this other one because it might not be good for you. You don't see that. Mm -mm. Yeah, you don't see a fair product comparison unless it's a third-party vendor, right? Mm -hmm. And all they're doing is selling links forward to, you know, it's pretty quick. You can pretty quickly figure it out. All they're doing is selling links forward to it. But to go to an actual business, like a business like ours, and say, 
we sell such a variety of brands, we can say, no, that rod might not be right for you. We have about four other models. So within Google, if you introduce the idea of competing products and explain why the competing products aren't, you know, why, why one might be better than another, Google says, that's an interesting page. And also, it, it's not just a dead end. So Google's recognizing that it's an interesting page. Google recognized that it's an interesting page. We'll just say Google. The truth could be saying for Bing and any other search engine. But if you have interesting content, compares and contrasts things, has real discussions and real words, and isn't just a generic Amazon copy and paste of a product description with the weight and size, Google or Google search engines are going to realize that you have a unique business. We put we put all of our effort into genuinely good information. We we until this last six months, we never paid for one bit of paid advertising on the internet. We put all of our effort. I, I said to our, our partners and our other managers, I said, why would we do that when we can pay, we could hire, you know, somebody, or it's myself, I do 90% of it. Why would we do that when we can put time into genuinely owning this content and, and also helping people, right? Like, I mean, you look at the net gain at the end of the day and you go, wow, if we put X number of hours into genuinely good content, we own the content, but we're also creating depth in our company. And a following, I mean... Uh, I'm not going to lie. There's times where I'm at the office. I'll take 15 minutes and hop on your website and watch a YouTube video. I mean, I've learned so much about fly fishing from your YouTube channel. And so it creates loyalty with me because if I'm spending six months a year, uh, before my next fishing trip and I'm watching a lot of your YouTube channel, and then when it goes time to book a trip, there are many, many awesome rivers in Oregon and Washington to fly mm -hmm. fish. But I always go the Yakima because... I can take the stuff I've learned on your videos and go apply them on the river that you are filming on. Yep. And you don't have to play guide roulette. You know yeah. us. You yeah. know, you know our you know our our attitude and our demeanor and we're we're all out we're not about hype. We're about educating people and and the catching is gonna take care of itself. You know, and like in business, the sales are gonna take care of themselves. You do the right things and you do the right things and you run your business in a sound manner and you do things like, okay. It's not as flashy, but we're going to spend a lot of time. It's not sexy. It's not, you know, most people will never appreciate, you know, how much work we put into just the product descriptions and product pages in our online mm -hmm. store. But guess who does? Google does. <laughs> and people land on it. So that was one thing that I would say, you know, we're one of the world leaders in e-commerce, you know, in fly fishing. And we haven't done any paid advertising. Several of the other things uh, that we did, we really chose preferred products. Instead of just trying to sell everything, we found products that we genuinely knew were good. We knew they were sound products, and we got behind a narrower group of products and said, you know what, this particular trout spay rod is, we're not going to you know, go out and claim it's the best and everything else is bad, but we believe in this product, and we're not afraid. We're going to unapologetically endorse products that we truly well, believe in. I think your, uh, like your beginner's wall in there, I don't know what you guys call it, but where you have all the... Uh, complete rod outfits. Mm -hmm. I was looking at those today, and none of those are junk. Where if you go into like a sportsman's warehouse or Cabela's, you're really taking a gamble spending a hundred dollars on a complete outfit, <laughs> right? Because there's a good chance it's going to be a piece of junk. Yeah, you the line, like the, the nice echoes, and that all. floating line will be the best sink tip you ever got. <laughs> and didn't know you were getting. Talk a little bit. One of the other takeaways I took from yesterday was uh, how education is such a part of your guys's business platform even if you're educating other people that take that knowledge to your competitors. Yeah, so... Because I, I kind of look at that in our industry. Oh, okay. Because we yeah, get yeah, so yeah. frustrated, right? We sit here and we spend two months helping a homeowner, educating them on every step of the process, giving them the, the best service we can, making them super knowledgeable on how to buy a house and how to yeah. finance it. And then they go to one of our competitors for X, Y, Z reason. Yeah. Right? And so... at a certain level that's frustrating, but at least I was, I was able to help them and they're taking my knowledge some, somewhere else, even if it's not here. And you kind of talked a little bit about that yesterday with, with what you guys do. Oh, I want everybody who goes and does anything in fly fishing, whether it's with a competitor or with us, to have the, an optimal experience. There, it, does, it does you no good if they go to your competitor and get a crummy home loan. You know, because they're much less likely to explore their options on, you know, I'm sure there's lots of different types of loans. I mean, there's uh, they could take out a second mortgage. They get a home equity line of credit. They could do all sorts of different lending permutations. Somebody who's comfortable and familiar with lending, maybe they want to buy a, a rental home. 
the more comfortable they are and the better experience they have in lending, you know, bar- or borrowing, the more likely you are to get them back, right? I mean, it, it, you know, creative, creative borrowers, I suppose, are great customers. And, uh, man, if they go to an, somebody else and have a, a negative experience, that doesn't help you. And, again, maybe it also, you know, because it bothered me for a long time uh, when somebody would go to a competitor. Of course, I want everybody's business, but we can't serve everybody. We'll start to do a crummy job for our core customers. Well, and there's a percentage of those customers in, in every industry, I think, but that will go to you, get all the knowledge, all the reviews on the product, how to use it, and then go to Amazon. Of course. Right? Or go to that easy retailer. Um, well, I used to, when I was going to college, I worked at Circuit City. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, uh, people would come see me, learn all about something, and then I know they left to go buy it at, online somewhere cheaper. Save 50 bucks. Save yeah. 50 bucks. <laughs> They're not saving anything. But, but I've, I've done the same thing. And at the yeah. end of it, I'm like, that was just, I spent all that time going down there and everything. I'm not making any money in that deal. So it's almost at some point you stop competing yeah. with them and compete with yourself on the service you provide and you, that gains that loyalty maybe yeah you you man i will talk anybody through any type of rod and, and reel and line selection and it's my job to get the sale but if i don't get the sale man i want them leaving i think of it like a dead end right like so if somebody comes to to you or me or whoever in your business all of a sudden becomes a dead end for them like they can't move through you beyond to to another purchase they're no longer going to call you so uh, if they come through you and have a great experience and they come all the way through your company and that, yes, they do go for whatever reason, I'm sure there's a litany of different reasons somebody might choose to do business with somebody else. You know, maybe it's because it's closer to their house. I mean, maybe it's just simple geography or whatever it is. But as long as you're not a dead end, as long as they move through you to get to something, you are an open phone line. You are an, you're, you're an open portal to get where they want to go. We do that all the time where we used to we used to really struggle with this where people would call for like a travel purposes, right? It's so like, hey, I'm thinking about going to Mexico. You know, we, you know, we, I mean, you know, part of what we do is plan, you know, international travel for people. They want to use our consultation to plan that big airplane trip and traveling overseas. And, uh, you know, before, if we didn't get that, you know, get that booking or get, because those commissions are a pretty big deal. The lodge's best use of marketing dollars from a marketing lodge in another country, their best use of marketing dollars is to pay us a commission on those. Anymore, I don't even care. I just flip them and say, yeah, you know, go, go to so-and-so, you know, do this, go there. And, you know, I'm not, I'm no longer a dead end. They can always count on me for, you know, to never get the hard sale. They can count on me to get efficient advice on exactly what they're going to be doing with without the hard sell and they can they can always count on us to provide answers <laughs> solutions and a route in fact just one more piece of little yeah. knowledge google loves it when your page routes through to more pages you ever find a dead end on the internet never mm. no. <laughs> you know why <laughs> pages that have dead ends and don't have through links you know where there's not a, a path for people to go through like a nat a, a, a navigational path don't get hits like when we build all of our pages we try to provide all of the resources that somebody might need regarding that product uh or that service all on one page but yeah you don't want to be a dead end well and just to go back to what you were talking about before you know if i am anything i'm a consumer right i love buying shit. oh yes you are i see yeah. that sweet howler brother shirt that yeah. you have on right now yeah. <laughs> which you can find on uh, redsflyshop.com <laughs> <laughs> um this is a sweet shirt. It is a sweet I've shirt. You are this, a consumer, right? I've I, never even heard of this brand, but we were in the store last night. I'm like, oh, I'm going to get a new shirt. And I'm like, I've never heard of it. but it's, it's I see really Ryan's, uh, that looks like a fresh new ball cap he's got. Uh, six months. I think we have that one in the pro shop, too. Do you have kids? Do you have kids' hats? Kids' sizes? Ryan needs a child size hat. No, nah, I can't say that we do. I don't know. A, uh, my boys, my boys were the, is actually my nine year old's hat right now, and it looks very good on him. So <laughs> maybe I just got a small head. But but what I was gonna say is, uh, uh, you know, fly fishing is an emotional de- is an emotional deal, like you talked about. But I get an emotional attachment to the equipment I buy. Uh, you know, I when I fish the Sage One I bought here two years ago, I think about that trip. I think about being out here. I think about. Uh, the guys that sold it to me, and it brings back you know some sentimental emotions from that purchase. Can I tell you something about forever. that sage fly rod? Yeah, somebody on Bainbridge Island, Washington State, built a specialist and a craftsman built that rod for you. 
They didn't build it for somebody else. They built that rod specifically for you by hand, often in front of their television in their own home with their own tools. No way. Yeah, so they build, they wrap a lot of those rods and build them at home. So they build, because they can only produce, they only have so much workspace at the shop. So when they're building like a, a high demand model, like a Sage One, they'll have an exact tool set and they'll actually have a wrap station and a workstation at their own house where they actually work on those things. But you know, Sage rods are very special. I mean, I that's primarily what I fish are Sage rods, but people build those rods for you. That's very different than the connection you get and we sell a lot of overseas built rods. Uh, we want to give people, you know, a big variety of budget and options. And there's some fantastic rods built, especially South Korea. Um, their tolerances and their machining and their craftsmanship are very good uh, South Korea, but uh, as well as other places. But uh, you don't have that same connection as somebody building that rod for you. You know, the same way 100 years ago, somebody might build you you know, a bow or a shotgun or whatever, you know, now it's a fly rod. They're building you the finest possible fly rod so that you have a great cast and you're going to own that rod the rest of your days. To me, that's a pretty special thing. Very special. Um, and they're local and mm -hmm. made in the U.S. And, you know, there's so many, you watch Shark Tank and you think it's impossible to make a profit by having a business in the U.S. They, everybody that brings a business idea to them, they always, the first thing they do is, all right, well, we're going to make this in China. And I've seen them refuse to give somebody a deal because they refuse to ha to have their equipment made outside the U.S. Yeah. So. Yeah, I mean the, I mean. Yeah, I mean logistics. I can't imagine running a company in South Korea. Um, you know, I mean just the logistics and the communication, everything else. There's lots of people are good at it, but something that has to be built to those types of tolerances. They have like 18 points of. I mean they're. Uh, it, somebody jump in and comment if I'm wrong here, but I think it was like 18. It's probably a lot more, but it was a ludicrous amount points of specific quality control where parts of the rod, cause they build them in different sections. And in mm -hmm. fact, different sections of those rods actually have different ingredients and elements within them. It's not just one rod that they cut into four pieces, but they engineer each piece with different materials, uh, to act a certain way. I mean, these things are so finely engineered. That's why they defy physics when they're cast. I mean, it just, it, they're, they absolutely defy physics. When you watch a long, beautiful, delicate fly cast, you're like, how is that even possible? But they don't just, ch I mean, there's so much that goes into it, but the quality control where they'll actually dispose, if they don't meet the criteria, they actually dispose those parts where almost any other, you know, rod built overseas, they just jam them together. Mm -hmm. And uh, if, uh, when you think about it, now we're talking about fly rod engineering. But uh, when you think about like a male ferrule and a female ferrule, if it if the male ferrule goes just, if it's not built, the diameter of that ferrule isn't just right, it will seat either too deep or too shallow into that female ferrule, <coughs> changing the entire dan dynamic of that, that rod. So if it goes in too far, it you know, creates one type of action. If it doesn't go in far enough, it creates another type of action. So they have to be engineered quite specifically. And... Uh, Anybody who says there's no difference between like, oh, it's much of baloney, you know, 900 bucks is way too expensive. Well, you're not a high end rod customer. Mm -hmm. You would never say that about a, ma I mean, a mountain bike, you know, um, you know, or a violin, you know, like you look at a musical instrument. How many people are going to say, oh, those Korean built, you know, or whatever violins built, you know, mass produced? And we're picking on Korea now, <laughs> but whatever, whatever those cheap, wherever the, a cheap violin is mass produced, would you ever compare it to like, you know, a, a handcrafted violin made by the finest violin maker in all of Europe? No. No, there, no. I mean, there'd be no comparison because you can hear the sound that comes out of it. Well, a fly rod, <laughs> depending on who's operating it, you you may not know the difference. I might be able to play that European violin and make it sound just as awful as the mass-produced one. <laughs> but uh, you put it in a you know professional's hands, and you're going to hear that sound that comes out of a fine violin. So anybody who says, like, oh, those cheap rods are just as good... That's a bunch of baloney. I sell a lot of the less expensive rods because they, they, they fit a budget and a profile for consumers that either, you know, they simply can't afford a higher end rod. But you can't say that they're the same thing. Well, beginner equipment has a very good place, right? Because if I would have bought the Sage 1 on my very first time I bought a uh, fly rod, I probably wouldn't appreciate it like I do after fishing $100 rods, $200 You're rods. Absolutely that, right. Like when I got that Lama glass that you were you were making fun of yesterday. It's Lammy glass. Uh, we call it Lama glass in Richfield, Washington. 
It's where they're from, <laughs> also, right? <laughs> I had, I, had, I think I had that same exact yeah. rod. There's five rods. No, it's a, it's a great rod, but yeah. uh, I was fishing, you know, the eighty-nine dollar Cabela's rods for a while, and then I went up to their store and bought that one on their seconds rack, for big like up, one hundred and fifty yeah. bucks. I'm like, man, this rod is incredible. Yep. And then going up to the Sage One, and I do that with a lot of my hobbies, right? Like if I were to start road racing, I want to go buy an eight thousand dollar bike. I'd start with maybe a used one that's high quality but fits my budget. And then hopefully when I get to that level, I have a different level of appreciation for the equipment. And an educated purchase, right? Like, Mm -hmm. you know, and it doesn't matter how much money somebody has, you know, and and this is true of so many things, but like most Americans, we have way too much junk in our garage, right? And you take a successful, let's just say, you know, a successful person, and that could be wealthy or just squared away, right? Like spiritually content, content in their job, good marriage, you know, kids, whatever. Uh, Kids, no kids, doesn't matter. But a successful and content, psychologically and spiritually healthy person, possibly wealthy or at least financially secure. You go into their garage, and if they're going to introduce new stuff into their garage, it's going to be well thought out. Now, you watch the show Hoarders, and I'm not sure a lot of those people would be described as spiritually, financially <laughs> content folks. You know, you go watch Hoarders, they're jamming more stuff in that garage than you don't do it. Meaning, so, somebody who's successful is making very careful purchases about what they put in their garage. Mm-hmm. They're thinking about them very, very well, like, hey... When I buy this, it's going to own a little part of me, meaning I have to now take care of it. I've got to put it somewhere, put it in a closet. It's going to own a part of my life. I'm introducing it to my home. So people who are successful generally make extremely well-calculated uh, uh, decisions, and that doesn't always mean expensive, but they tend to t- think things through a little bit better. And when I say this, what I mean is it doesn't matter how much money you have. It would be ludicrous for somebody, it doesn't, doesn't matter how much money they make or have or whatever, to just come in and go, yeah, I just want a nine hundred dollar one. No, they're gonna go. You know, I'm gonna buy. I'm gonna get into fly fishing. I may or may not like it. I have not proven. There's no evidence that I'm in love with fly fishing. Why would I spend nine hundred bucks? They're gonna make a good sound purchase. They're gonna spend one hundred and fifty, two hundred bucks, whatever it is. Sometimes they'll spend nine hundred if they have more evidence that they're gonna love it. And because that one hundred and fifty or two hundred dollar rod is going to end up with a little piece of their life, and it may mm-hmm. wa- it may wind up in the garage sale, or it may wind up being given to a grandson, you know, or somebody uh, two years down the road. But it's funny to watch people's purchasing decisions. I have a lot of you know customer you know interaction, and folks that I would say are successful. One of their attributes are they. Heavy, they make calculated purchases on these things. They ask some questions, one of which is, do I have evidence I'm in love with this sport? If I should, <laughs> so, yeah. Because if they're not sure yet, they're not going to spend. They're not going to buy top end. If they're, un, if they're uncertain, they're like, yeah, this might be just kind of those one, one of those one-time things that mm-hmm. I do it in Yellowstone once, and the, the fly rod is never to be seen again. Uh, I'll share with you my personal testimony on this. Okay. <laughs> Why? <laughs> Why? <laughs> one of those idiotic things I've done. Like, I'm pretty calculated. Like, I don't like a messy garage. Like, if something gets to own a piece of my garage, it better be well thought out. I go up and I go spear fishing. okay, <laughs> on a lake. And I immediately, like, I see my buddy, Cameron. He's out there he's whacking some of these suckers. They're like a pest species. We just, uh-huh. you know, we're allowed to go out and spear fish them, you know, snorkel down, dive down, spear fish them underwater with a Hawaiian sling, and you can just pitch them on the bank. And uh, non, non-game, non you know, they're like, yeah, they want them out of this lake. And it's about the most fun you can have in the water. Totally. Fishing. Love it. Love hunting. If combines hunting and fishing all at one. I'm like, I'm loving it. So I go down, I do this for five or ten minutes, right? And I'm like, I'm crazy about it. I'm like, man, this is awesome. And uh, so immediately I realize that I'm going to have to give Cameron back all his gear because I didn't bring any of this gear. So I, I come out of the water and I think, I got to go to the dive shop. I got to buy all this stuff. And, of course, I'm young, emotional, and unsuccessful at the time. And I go, I'm going to go buy all this. So I immediately run down to the dive shop and buy all the best, all the best crap they got. Like, hey, load me up. Like, <laughs> I'm a total sucker. I go in, and I buy all of this spearfishing stuff, and I come back, and I spearfish for about another 45 minutes that entire weekend. <laughs> and you know how many times I've used that spearfishing stuff since? Zero. Yeah. Not one time. It's all rotten. My kids use it all. I bought the great mask and everything. My kids use it in the swimming pool. <laughs> <laughs> they, they, they spear stuff with the, the Hawaiian sling. I think it's all rotten. But, like, I kind of audit myself because I'm like, I'm a, you know, 
younger and unsuccessful and very emotional, like those purchasing decisions, I don't see a person that I would call like a uh, a business mentor walk in and make those types of irrational emotional decisions. Yeah. <laughs> and so I kind of laugh back at those decisions I made, you know, in well, my 20s and whatnot. I just went through that same thing because uh, after reading 12 Rules for Life by Jordan Peterson, I was like, well, I guess I need to clean my room. You know, yeah. so that's his big thing is before you go out and, and criticize other people, clean your room. And he's very literal. He doesn't yeah. mean like check yourself. He's like, no, go physically clean your room. So I read that book. I went out and uh, cleaned out my garage for the first time in like six years. My <laughs> wife, we had, you can fit one car in there and there's just a pile. Right? Yeah. And I picked through it and put stuff back and I organized it all. And all the purchases I found from when I was in my 20s, like a... a a remote control little RC <laughs> boat. <laughs> I was probably okay. Like you six, beat me. That's much less useful. I was probably six hundred bucks into it. I had all the special motors and and at the time you, know, you probably weren't making much money. No, like a completely irrational purchase. Yeah, yeah. and uh, I thought it was so cool to go out in this little pond and use this RC boat, uh, but lots of stuff like that. And it's funny how. Yeah, you don't, you don't, yeah, you don't see like a a guy that you and I, like, you know, we're in our, I'm almost 40. I don't know how old you are exactly, but like, if you and I were to pick out like business and life and family mentors, they're not running around buying RC boats. No. Like spontaneously, you know, maybe. Well, and even like uh, Roger's a great example, right? Uh, Very successful. He uh, owns the museum where our normal studio is. And uh, you don't see him going out. And I mean, he could walk in to a fly shop like this and have whatever he wants. Yeah. Well, you don't see him just buying random no. stuff. No. Yeah. No, he's going to think it through because it's going to own a piece of him and mess up his garage, and then he's got to clean it out and figure out how to get rid of it yep. four years from now. Yeah. <laughs> so it's a. It, there's also the saying, like, you know, make your bed in the morning. You know, I, I, uh, I think uh, McMaster has a very motivational uh, speech. Uh, he says, make your bed in the morning. And mm-hmm. it's, it's kind of parallel to Jordan Peterson's advice. You know, clean your room. Take care of your stuff. Take care of your business. You clean it, then you can work on making it beautiful. Yep. Right? Um, another another uh, analogy that I see a lot, too, is uh, the clothes people wear, right? So, like, uh, we know people that are uber successful could wear, you know, Armani suits and do all this. And usually the ones you see like that aren't the ones that are uber <laughs> successful. It's the guy wearing a 20-year-old Carhartt sweatshirt yeah. and Levi's, right? Yeah. That, that isn't going out and, and presenting himself in a in a I'm rich kind of way. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. yeah, his car's paid for. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh yeah, there's a there's a, there's a lot of you know you have to choose your mentors wisely. We talked a bit about that yesterday, and uh, you know that's one of the oh gosh, there's a I can't remember where I saw, it, but you know who you choose as mentors is going to be infinitely more important than what you study in school. And I hmm. either read an essay or listened to a podcast. I want to say I read it, and uh, it was like choosing five mentors for different reasons. Like, you know, sit down and really self-examine who your mentor is. And maybe listeners will do that right now. You know, think about people who are important in your life that you would want to model your life after. And uh, I have to say that after I read that article, I began some self-examination on who I had chosen as mentors and who I had surrounded myself with and what a direct impact they had on my life. Certainly more than my college education, which I I value greatly um, because that did introduce me to one of my men- one of my five that I would consider important mentors. Well, and in a way, it's almost they can have more impact in a different way than your parents because they're not your parents, right? Well, you chose them. You chose so them. So you man. didn't choose your parents. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I, I've been blessed with wonderful parents, far from perfect, but you know, wonder you're not going to hear me complaining about them. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, but it's yeah, easier to take advice. When it's not your dad. You chose, yeah. Right? You chose them. Yeah. And, you know, they provide this perspective that you know what dad's script is, right? So you could write the script. You know, you know what he's going to say. You know, don't do that. You should do this. You already know what it's going to be. And you, deep down inside, you know, it's probably the right answer. I've got a 14-year-old, so I'm really good at this right now. <laughs> so the dad, <laughs> and she'll just look at me like, okay, dad. <laughs> Okay. Uh, so I'm very good at this right now. I'm like, you already know what I'm going to say, don't you? She's like, yep. <laughs> but uh, yeah, you know the dad script. And then when you hear the dad script being uh, spoken by, and your mentor, you know, doesn't have to be, you know, if you're a man, um, doesn't have to be male, be female. 
But you know the dad script and where it's coming and where it's going. And when you hear the dad script or that being paralleled by a mentor that you sought out and you went and chose to be in your life, uh, it is definitely much, much more impactful. And especially if there's people in their 20s and 30s, you know, you know, especially men, you know, choose those very wisely um, because they're going to have a direct, you know, very market impact in your life. And then surround yourself with people that you, uh, you want to be like because you're much more likely to be like them. And uh, no better hobbies easier to do that than hunting and fishing. Right? Yeah, there's I'm, so many good mentors out there that you can find just by getting involved with those type of activities. Man, I'll tell you something that keeps your life grounded, you know. And uh, for me, it it kept me gainfully employed because I had to make enough money and also I had to have enough freedom to go go hunt and fish and enjoy the things that I like to do. And so, you know, a lot of my hustling and I you know, really was just so that I could generate enough free time and enough freedom. That's why I wanted to be my own business owner so that mm-hmm. I could work hard and play hard and be able to enjoy in addition to, you know, I'm a big game guide too. I guide some big game hunting in the fall. Uh, you know, I teach hunters ed. You guys know a lot about me and all the different stuff I like to do hunting wise, but selfishly part of why I want to own my own business and be successful. is So I had the freedom to go do the things that bring maximum amounts of joy to my life, you know, and early on, as I laid the groundwork for that, I, you know, was blessed to have a, you know, wonderful wife and a great family and all that. And I had kids at, you know, relatively young age, got married at a relatively young age and, you know, that's all worked out great, but selfishly, you know, success, you know, in business is ultimately you ask yourself why you're doing it. And it's ultimately to generate more time and that's something that's finite and you can't get back so that you can go do the things that bring you the maximum amount of joy Mm -hmm. you know uh i have a uh i had a really strong mentor in the for like the last 15 years and he recently passed last year and he was an avid duck hunter avid fly fisherman did he bring you to duck hunting yes cool because I remember you saying that you kind of got into that as an adult, you know, not so much as a youth. Yeah, I started pheasant hunting in my early 20s and then um, uh, fell in love with upland hunting and fell in love with bird dogs. And then he got me into the duck hunting. But uh, he had a little trout pond on his property, and I'd go out there after work and, and practice fly fishing with him. And this was probably five, six years ago, and I was really working hard really had a lot of big goals and was working my ass off to do it. And he was a really successful business owner as well. And uh, one day I'm out there and I'm... With a trout pond. With a trout pond, yeah. Yeah. And I'm out there and uh, I'm telling him all my goals. This is what I'm doing. I'm you know, going to go work for this company and I'm going to take over the world. And this is how I'm going to do it. And kind of getting his opinion on it. And he gave me some advice. And then he said, you know, I did that. I worked my ass off when I was younger, my 20s, 30s, 40s, and did really well. My goal was to work so I didn't have to work, right? Work so hard that some don't have to, to work. That. <laughs> and so he could enjoy yeah. his trout pond more. Yeah, and then, uh, but you know what he said? He goes, if I had to do it over again, I'd probably do it differently because I'm 60, I think he was 63 at the time. And he goes, I can still hustle, work hard, and make a lot of money, be successful. But I have two uh, bad knees, a, a hip replacement. Um, I'm older. I can't hunt and fish like I could when I was younger. So if I had to do it over again, I might have spent more time hunting and fishing when I was in my prime, when I was healthy, and really hit work hard when I was older, and I couldn't do those things. Yeah. And uh, it, I, I was kind of shocked to hear him say that. I was like, oh, never thought about it that way. And so uh, I did. I mean, I, I continue to work hard, but I made time to do more of those things with the people that in my family and friends while I'm healthy, while I'm young, could do those things. Uh, so th- it was kind of a different way to look at that work-life balance. Yeah, one tip is write your own schedule first. You know, write in the things that you need to do during the week first, and then, you know, within reason, obviously, you know, you work, work has to kind of fall in around those types of things, but... You go there first, and, uh, you know, whether it's, you know, kids' soccer games, whether it's coaching baseball, you know, being with your kids, hunting, fishing, whatever brings you, you know, maximum amount of joy and contentment. Write those in first, then let work kind of fall in around those uh, instead of the opposite. I did the opposite for years, and, man, my work efficiency grew exponentially once I started to write the personal stuff first and then let work fall around it. 
because most people make a to-do list, right? Mm-hmm. And your to-do list is, it, it, it's easy to fill it up. It could be four pages long, especially as a motivated business owner that, that enjoys his job, which I love my job. So my to-do list could be four pages long. <coughs> Instead, what, I, what I've started doing is making a list of things that I'm not going to do. I'm, you know, I don't find efficiency mm. or great value in that. I'm not going to do that. And I'm going to eliminate that from my plate. And I'm going to promise myself, you know, I'm not going to dive into a new, whatever the new program, new class, new product, new product line, new adventure. You know, there's an, there's an unlimited number of things we could do in our, our business, you know, from hunting, fishing, sporting clays, international travel, resort, restaurant. There's a wine tasting here at three o'clock, which isn't just a little bit. I mean, there's a million things that we can do. But what I'll try to do is make a list of things that I'm go- not going to allow myself to get sucked into that are very tempting and, uh, or that I can contract out or that I can delegate. And when I started to do that, my, my efficiency, I began to work much more within my sweet spot, which is, you know, video blogging, teaching, mentoring our staff, you know, making sure that I'm training my replacements and other people that can, you know, that I can delegate things to, uh, that I can delegate things. There's a party going on on the river back there. That sounds like so much fun. I'm not going to lie. Like, it's kind of annoying <laughs> right now. <but laughs> well, and there's so many things to do on this river besides fish. I mean, uh, it's fun to see all the people floating down the river for fun. But uh, one more thing, because I know we got to wrap up, because you you, there's a, an event here in a minute. But uh, uh, Warren Buffett, um, what he said to do is take out a, a, a notepad and write down all your ideas, all your goals, all the things you want to accomplish and make a big list and then take the top three and throw the rest away. Yep. And it's similar to what I was yeah. trying to describe, but more eloquent. And, and he said that that's what the successful people do. And the really successful people get that down to one thing. And if you have a task in a day that doesn't directly impact one of those three priorities then you either don't do it or delegate it to somebody else. Yeah. And you, you just get laser focused. And um, um, the Apple guy, Steve Jobs, Yep. Uh, he said the same thing. It's the one thing. Um, you know, Apple always focused on one product at a time. Um, and I think, weren't they involved with Pixar? Pixar uh, did no, that's thing. where he went after. He went after. Yeah. And so in that book, Ego is the Enemy, it goes through and it dissects the careers of a lot of these these people that were highly successful and uh, the evolution of where they had to start from scratch. Um, and anyway, but we, we're, we're trying to wrap up so I could go down that rabbit hole well, again. Was, yeah, because he was saying like Toy Story when he was at Pixar, Pixar they could have put out, you know, uh, movie companies put out 20, 30 movies in a year. Pixar said, okay, we're going to put out one and it's going to be really, really good. And they had all the technology behind it and that was Toy Story. But all right, uh, we're going to get kicked out of here. Um, well, we're getting kicked out of here for good reason. There's going to be a sweet wine tasting on this deck. So you get the ladies back over here uh, in about. We're going to partake. It's uh, Ryan's wife's birthday. So we'll definitely be doing the wine tasting. <laughs> you guys you guys are booked up. You got uh, a big wedding party here this afternoon, too. That's right. Yeah. So uh, redsflyshop.com. Um, check out the YouTube page if you're interested at all in fly fishing or want to learn about it that's that's the place to start is joe's uh, uh youtube page what else yeah that's it just see us at reds uh we do lots of different stuff at the resort it's always a great time we're open year round uh thanks again joe and thanks for yesterday appreciate it thank you all right buddy all right, all right. everyone uh if you haven't yet please go on to our gofundme page and help contribute to the children's justice center um that uh, uh we're gonna uh, close that page on uh the 22nd of september So uh, there you go. All right, guys, see you next time. Take care.